Neighbor authentication is highly recommended for OSPF. It prevents unauthorized users from forming neighbor relationships and potentially compromising the network. This is especially important in a campus environment or within the enterprise. Ethernet ports are conveniently positioned for end users to connect their devices to. The last thing a network operator would like is for an end user to plug in a router, start up OSPF, and interfere with the operation of the campus or enterprise network. OSPF version 2 has authentication built in. There are two ways of doing it, either via a plain text password or an MD5 hash. Most people use the MD5 hash version. The important thing is that we have a shared secret that's not easily readable on the wire. OSPF version 3 does not have authentication built in. Instead, it uses the standard IP security header that's part of IPv6. There are two types supported here as well, the MD5 hash and the SHA-1. Let's look at OSPF v2 neighbor authentication configuration example. Here we're configuring authentication for area 0. Interfaces still need the authentication key. So we go to the OSPF configuration, state that area 0 is going to use authentication simply by area 0 authentication message digest. And then we go to the interface and do IP OSPF message digest key and whatever that key password is going to be for that interface. All other devices on that shared link need to have the same key for them to talk OSPF to each other. We can configure authentication per interface only if we want to. We don't need to configure it for the whole area. And in that case, we simply go to the interface, state we're going to do neighbor authentication, and then supply the key, as you see in the example. For OSPF version 3, we can configure authentication for interfaces in an area by starting up the OSPF process and doing area 0 authentication, IPsec, SPI 256, MD5, and then supplying the key to be used there. Or we can configure authentication per interface. To originate a default route on OSPF, we use the simple command line default information originate under the router OSPF process. And this will originate a default route into OSPF only if a default route exists in the RIB. For those of you who are used to ISIS, this is different behavior. If we always want to originate a default route, regardless of whether there's one in the RIB or not, we go to the OSPF process and do default information originate always. The extra always keyword will ensure the default route is announced at all times. And there are equivalent commands for OSPF version 3. To operate OSPF on a point-to-point -point Ethernet link, we don't actually need a designated router and backup designated router. There are only two devices. So what we do is we disable the DR and BDR election. And this is much more efficient. We go to the interface and the simple keyword IP OSPF network point-to-point -point will convert this to a point-to-point -point link as far as OSPF is concerned. Note that both devices on either end of the point-to-point -point Ethernet need the configuration command to be supplied. And there are equivalent commands for OSPF v3. Remember, OSPF version 2 is for IPv4, and OSPF version 3 is for IPv6. The two versions of OSPF do not interact with each other at all. So to conclude the presentation, OSPF is a link state routing protocol. It's quick and simple to get started, but it has a huge number of options and features to cover almost every single type of network topology. In this series here, we have covered the minimum requirements that any network operator needs to deploy OSPF. If we haven't mentioned it here, the feature is more than likely not required for your network infrastructure. Network operators keep the OSPF design simple. 
minimum number of prefixes will give the fastest possible convergence. Running over 400 routers in a single area is entirely feasible.